phoned the manager and said, like, I've had a car crash. He sort of said, I'll phone you back, come back to me and said, oh, we've got a game Friday. If you're not back here by Tuesday, then like, you're not playing and like, that's it, you're out of the team. Probably seven, eight months every day would be in tears on the way to training because I didn't, I didn't believe that's where my life was. Yeah, I'm Rowan Vine, ex-professional footballer. Yeah, I grew up in Basingstoke and you know, I played football from, from the start. That's my earliest memories playing with my brothers. My dad was a good footballer, um, like semi-pro, could have, could have probably gone further, but, but didn't. Just football, 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 like from, from really early. Yeah, I was about nine or ten and got scouted with a few other of my friends from, from my Sunday team for Portsmouth. I, was, I played a year up, always felt I was good, always felt I was, you know, I'm, I'm a striker, so I always felt I was impacting games and, yeah, got spotted and just a natural progression really to start training with a professional team and I took to it quite easily and just saw it as a bit more of a challenge and I think everyone wanted to be a professional and I just had that chance at like nine, ten and didn't really look back from them. I was at Portsmouth for like two, three years and I quite enjoyed it and everything and then Southampton came in for me and I knew there was obviously a rivalry there. Uh, they were in the Premier League, they was a bit better and I was sort of in England set up as well at that age and it was pretty, it was a, a pretty tough decision for me because it was the first time someone's come in and said that, you know, sort of like a mini transfer really and I didn't, didn't really know what to do but after speaking to my mum and, and a few other people decided to go to Southampton. The move didn't really work out because I was I was going, started going for a growth spurt and this is sort of when the first sort of emotional sort of distresses happened with me in football is that I shot up a bit, like about six inches in a year and I'm obviously a striker but I was small and then like 13, 14 I, I grew, got a bit skinny and lanky and uh, didn't, lost my way a little bit with football and uh, yeah, it didn't go well and the coach, instead of um, sort of helping me out and, and looking for the best scenario, yeah, just, it was a bit negative, really negative, uh, got called names and stuff by the coach and at that point just, just sort of wanted to, wanted to leave. Um, I shot up quite a lot, I was nearly six foot by this point, like 14, started playing me in a different position, uh, like, like defensive midfield or, or defender, like I'm not, not very good in the air. I couldn't tackle, it was never my game and uh, yeah, called me like a six foot gimp at half time in the game against Bristol Rovers. Um, called me a pygmy, just shout telling me like, you can't tackle, like what's the matter with you, all this kind of stuff. And I, j I just thought, you know, that's a little bit too much and I left, I left with my mum. I've always been a competitor, I've been a winner because I've got I've got four brothers, like three older brothers that play football, my dad and stuff, and you know, banter's one thing and stuff like that. And I'd always been, you know, I always try and get under the skin of opponents, even at that age. But to see your, you know, your manager, the coach, the person that's uh, asked you to come to the club, just sort of ridiculing you in front of the teammates at half time, it was, yeah, it was, I didn't know how to deal with it. I just felt myself like boiling inside and getting upset. So I just obviously left and, Went home with my mum and never went back. Um, the fallout from that was that there was a phone call and he just said to my mum, he's not good enough, he's never gonna be a player, so that's, that's it done. Like, no letter or anything. And yeah, from a year before that, being in the England setup and, and being at Portsmouth for being happy to, to coming out of there at 14 <laughs> and thinking, wow, I can't be that good and, and this kind of stuff. And yeah, it can only, only take one person sometimes to, to, to do that. And, I said to my mum, I'm going to stop playing football and I think I was probably looking for her to say, no, 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 but she just said, all right, no problem. Probably didn't play for four, three, four months and I was quite lucky because my coach at Portsmouth, he sort of started making contact and saying, come back here, like, you know, we like you here. Um, it's pretty tough because you have to go back there, tail between your legs a little bit and you've had a little knock, which was a big knock at the time, it's the first time someone's had that negative impact on me as a footballer because me growing up football was my that was my safe place that was the stage that was like where I felt I could express myself and had that freedom and I sort of sort of started questioning that from that really early age and it changed me as a as a teenager because I went back to Portsmouth done well and in the end it gave me a little bit more of an edge because I became a little bit more um I don't know, maybe aggressive, 
a little bit more confrontational. In certain areas all around the country, if you're, say you play for Portsmouth, there's going to be a lot of Portsmouth players from Portsmouth. If you play for Southampton, the same, same as any parts, anywhere, London, Reading, anywhere, it's going to be the same. So, yeah, they, they obviously weren't happy that I'd left and I was, I was quite a main player of the team at the, at the time. So, yeah, they weren't happy and I think they were less happy when I came back because it's like, oh, well, you've come back. Um, and there are obstacles that, you know, that you have to face, like, you know, I've, I've got an absent father. I did have all through my teenage years, and they're the times when you sort of look around and, you know, I've got a big family, but you, you sort of, I did feel alone quite a lot um, in, at that time, and it obviously left an impact because it's, I still talk about it and, and feel it now. The scenario at Portsmouth was that I never, I moved down when I was 16 and done my YTS, so like the scholarship there, and. I was doing well, um, made my debut at 18 in the first team and, and got a professional contract, but I was a bit uncomfortable with the way they, they'd done the contract and, and stuff. And I didn't really feel wanted and I wanted to leave. So I sort of looked around and Palace had shown an interest and a couple of other teams and I just felt like I was more um, suited to going and play for a different team you know my in, in my youth team we played in sort of a southeast counties league with like south end palace millwall luton all them kind of teams and we were sort of pigeonholed as a bit like we were from portsmouth a bit fuggish like we only had white players um and sort of i'd grown up a little bit different to that and it just i just didn't really enjoy it my time there i couldn't be myself um didn't feel like I was really wanted too much. So yeah, I wanted to look elsewhere, but that was when they sort of told me you can't, you, there's no way you can go. Like it'd be a tribunal. I never, I didn't know any of this stuff. And um, yeah, so I signed, um, I signed a free, I signed a four year deal, I think. Um, and yeah, then I was in and around the first team from then. Graham Ricks was the manager. He came in um, after I'd had a couple of other managers and I was in and around the first team, but I was getting frustrated at, like 18, 19, I wanted to, I wanted to play football. It was a, it was a period I, didn't, I don't think I played for like four months. Uh, I was ready to go and play men's football. Um, and sort of, I didn't know what had happened, but Graham Ricks and Jim Duffy came in from Chelsea and bought a few players and there was a, a bit of a shock to the system because the assistant manager was quite aggressive and he was quite aggressive with me. And it felt like I was getting bullied a little bit, a young player in the first team. and. Yeah, he was on to me. Um, so like, yeah, Graham Ricks had just come out of prison. Um, you know, I, there was a lot of stuff going on that like I didn't, you know, he, he'd, he'd been in prison f f for having sex with an underage girl. You know what I mean? My sister was the same age and it was just all these kind of things. I just didn't, it didn't sit right with me. A lot of the things going on. So I wasn't difficult. I just wanted to play football, but I was trying to get away from there to go and play football. Um, and then they, they got the sack anyway, so Harry Redknapp came in. Um, and then I just went on a sequence of loan moves. Uh, I went on loan three times, so I played, I think, 150 games on loan, which it's not really done now. It wasn't really done then, but I just, I wanted to play football. I just needed to play football. I, had a, I knew I had a burning desire not to, not to be in, on the bench or in the reserves. I needed to play football. I went to Brentford on my first loan um, when I was 19 and I, I, yeah, I was probably earning £350 a week. Um, I was living in Portsmouth but I, t I went on loan and wasn't worried about money and stuff like that because I didn't have any anyway. So, But then by the time I'm driving to Brentford and you know every day on my own I'm sort of like I'm, I'm and then my girlfriend got pregnant so it was I was, I, was under the, I was under pressure a little bit. I'd done really well when I was at Brentford. I scored like 13 goals in the season, top goal scorer. Um, so then in the summer, I went back to Portsmouth and then they were, um, they were talking about what, what they're going to do with me, go, can I go on loan again? And decided I was going to go on loan again, but I ended up going to Colchester because, yeah, they offered me like, triple my money and like, I needed money. Like it was, at that point, it was sort of like, you're a footballer. I've just played 45 games in, I think it was still division two, but what would be league one now? But you know, like I'm not, 
I'm not being able to live really. So yeah, I had to sort of try and first time in my life I had to start thinking about like finance and stuff. So yeah, I went to Colchester because they offered them more money, but obviously put a strain on me because it's it's quite a bit further than than say Brentford or something. It was you know it was a and my girlfriend had a had my first son then as well. So um, like I say, the way I've grown up and. You know, like I've always been competitive. I come from a, a you know, a, a background where you need to, you need to, to fight. You bring your backs against the wall, and you know, she was pre my, my ex missus was pregnant. Went to Colchester. I had to do well, and I done well. I done well again. I scored like 12 goals. I think I played left wing. Had a few things go, like off the pitch. A few things went the wrong way. My mum had a heart attack. She was only 49. Um, my brother got sent to prison for three years, um, who I, I've always looked up to as a role model and stuff like that. And you know, like, and then I had a, I've got a two month old baby. So now I've got to try and concentrate on football. So there's so much stuff thrown in at a young age, at like 20 years old. Um, and it's hard to prioritize what you're, what you're concentrating on, but the manager just wanted me to concentrate on football. Um, and I, I had a car crash. Um, with my son in the car and, and his mum and he was like a month old and I crashed into a petrol station. Um, I hit my head, I had like 16 stitches in my head, but every, everyone else was okay. But So this happened on a Saturday night on, after I come back from a game, like um, an away trip and sort of phoned the manager and said like, I've had a car crash, um, I need a few days, like, I'm in hospital, um, I've got like a, some stitches and some staples in my head and that, like my, the family's all right, but I need a few days. And he sort of said, I'll phone you back, come back to me and said, oh, we've got a game Friday. If you're not back here by Tuesday, then like, you're not playing and like, that's it, you're out of the team. And I just, you know, like you, you're 20, 21 with all the stuff going on off the pitch, that happens. And I'm a lone player trying to make my way. And yeah, it just, it just, over these kind of times, you start seeing a different side of football because I just want to play football. Now I've had to make a decision really based on finance that I didn't really want to have to make, but I have done. And then now when you need some support and stuff like that, things, things can happen to anyone at any age off the pitch. And it was just a, it sort of felt like I was being pressured. No, no, you're playing, that's, that's it. Uh, you know, like the team comes first sort of thing. And, all these little things you start, you sort of, you, they just stack up over time, and you see things differently. I, I'm sure it's in any any industry, but I think we all have a sort of sense of football being the promised land, and you know it's all good, and as long as you're getting paid well and you're training every day and playing, like that's it. There should be no complaints, and really and truly, that's not reality. Um, and I think people are starting to understand that a little bit. I have, I have opinions, I'm an opinionated person, I'm a, I'm a vocal person, I always have been, um, especially when it comes to football because that's my life, I've dedicated my life to football, so even at 20, 21, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, you're going to hear my side of things and I said to the manager, look, this is, um, I've come here on loan and I'm trying to concentrate on my career, also like, I'm helping the team, but you know, this is, these things are happening. I need I need some support. You need a you need something um, to be able to switch off from just the football side of things. And and that was sort of my mindset from early. That but you're always fighting against it because the football has to come first. So I wanted to play every minute of every game, of course. But if you you have a car crash and you've got 16 stitches, you probably need a couple of weeks to just just chill or whatever. And um, yeah, it just um, it sort of swallows you up. You, if you don't prioritise football and put it first at every single decision, you, it's going to go against you. Like going back to Brentford, I was 19. I didn't tell anyone my, my missus was pregnant because I was afraid that people would say, oh, you're, like, you're not focusing on football. Do you, do you know what I mean? And that is sort of what a lot of people go through in, in football. It, it, you know, what we've been told the whole time and what I was told was that you can't have anything else in your life. It's got to be football, eat, breathe, sleep, football. Like what they, they even use that as a, a moniker for, for things like. And, and for me now, looking back, you have to switch off. You have to. You have to have other interests. You have to spend your time doing other stuff to maximise yourself when you go on the pitch. And that's, that's important. And that's a message I try. And my son's both 
play football. My, my oldest son's at Aldershot, he's doing really well, he's 18, but I will say to him, you, you know, give everything when you're there. As soon as you come out of the stadium or out of the training ground, you, that's, that's your time. That was something that, that, that sort of came out of nowhere. I've always, I've always had a bad back and always struggled to do um, sort of strength and conditioning sessions, weights and everything, pull-ups, everything like that. Um, and in, back in my day of in the youth team, you'd have to do like a couple of sessions a week in the gym. And I, I just couldn't do stuff. And the, 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 the initial response to that is, ah, oh, he's lazy, he doesn't want to do it. And I was like, well, I'm in pain. So all this was going on, I always had a bad back. And uh, when, I, when I finally left Portsmouth, I went on loan to Luton. And then in the next summer, they, they, they wanted to sign me permanently. So I signed, but I hadn't passed a medical. And I had a bad back and they knew I had a bad back, but I already signed the contract. So they sent me to like three specialists, ended up having some blood tests. Um, and testing positive for a, a certain gene type. And then within that gene type, you're like, you can have one of sort of eight diseases. Had some more scans and tests, and yeah, they, they, they found a case of Crohn's in, in my intestines, and then it was causing a secondary disease, which was inflammatory arthritis of, of the lower part of my back. So I got diagnosed at 21, but the professor that diagnosed me obviously was in Southampton, he's not a football background or anything. He, he just, he sort of said to me, look, there's treatments. We're gonna run a treatment that we think will work. But if these treatments don't work, like, you know, this, this is a problem, it's a genetic problem. And you, know, you could be in a wheelchair by the time you're 40. Like, he actually said that to me at 21. And I'm thinking, I don't know, I've got, I've got to play football. I've got, to, this is my career. Um, so all the way through my career, he, they would always have to go back to the professor when signing a contract to, to see whether I was capable of seeing out the contract for insurance reasons. Um, so that was a shock and the treatment worked. Like I was out for three or four months, um, but the treatment worked. So then after that, like while I was playing professionally, it always got paid for because you couldn't claim an insurance because it was genetic. So it always got paid for by the clubs It was as part of my deal. Um, but. You know, again, it was one of them things where I did have flare-ups all through my career, like my stomach. Um, there was one occasion when I was playing for Birmingham. It normally happened on, on night games for some reason. You'd eat through the day, you'd have to eat whatever you'd eat pre-match. But there was something about night games when I started running, I'd get these stomach cramps. And a couple of um, other players have been diagnosed with colitis, I think Darren Fletcher and a few others. but. Um, I always kept it to myself. I, like the club would have known because I was having these injections, but if I had a flare up in terms of like my stomach, I would keep it to myself because I didn't want, again, I didn't want to be out of the team, like, you know, with a stomach ache effectively. And that's how it was sort of seen. So I used to battle through it quite a lot. Um, there was one instance of Birmingham against Norwich. I was playing for Birmingham. Um, and like, I had to come off. I had to come off five minutes for a half time because the stomach cramps were so bad. Like, I'd like shit myself on the pitch and everything, try to carry on and I just had to come off. Then you've literally come off with a stomach ache. So, you know, in, in that kind of world, it's, again, you've let the team down or, or whatever. So that was, that was, it's always been tough and it's always been something I've had to be aware of. With the manager, Steve Bruce, obviously he wasn't that on the ball with, with anything like that anyway probably didn't even, as long as you're fit to play or whatever, you've made yourself available, then he couldn't believe it I was coming off. I was in the toilet at half time, literally, and uh, he couldn't believe I was, and then it's, it's as if you're less of a man because you've come off with a stomach ache. It was normally my back that was bad because the arthritis was obviously more of a problem if you're running around and stuff. The stomach would only come on every now and then, so, yeah, there, there was a reason for it and it was explained after, but we lost the game 1-0. <laughs> you know, in football, it's like, like you say, fans at the stadium be like, what's he coming off with? Like, and that's sort of how it, how it was anyway. But yeah, it was just another, another thing I've had to deal with physically and sort of emotionally as well.
Yeah, I mean, I went, I went on loan to Luton in League One and um, we won the league um, with 98 points. We, we weren't expected to, we, was one of the, we, we weren't fancied at all, but I went on loan because Mick Harford and Mike Newell were there and Brian Steen and they're all strikers and Mick Harford had seen me play for Colchester and I thought, for my development, I'm not getting any development at Portsmouth. So for my development at um, next stage, I could work with strikers and yeah, I scored nine and I got about 18 assists when we went up. Um, I'm more, I was always more of a link man striker and then I signed there permanently um, for about 250 grand. And the first season I was out for three months with the, while they checked the back and getting diagnosed with all that kind of stuff. And I came back and in the championship and I, I played 20 and scored 10. And I've, I really felt like I, I was, I'd arrived in terms of in the championship, I was capable and then obviously started the next season. And I think I scored 14 in about 27, 28. Up, and then they were, they had some financial problems, difficulties back then times, and they were dropping down the league. And yeah, I got sold for three million in the January. So like the, from leaving, from leaving Portsmouth with an injury, you know, like a year and a half later, I've, I've gone for 10 times the amount and I've gone and I always felt that player was in there. Even though other people probably didn't, I always felt like it's coming and it's just gonna, might take a bit longer. Obviously had the setbacks and that and, yeah, I went to Birmingham in the, in the January and they were eight points clear at the top of the champ. So I was, I was effectively going to a team that was going to be a Premier League team. And that was, yeah, that was big for me. Yeah. I felt good. I felt good. I've always been one where, like I say, the money is irrelevant to me. I've never, it's never, ever been my, my target, my goal. I don't rate success by finance. I never have done. Um, so it was just another step, like I'd come from Portsmouth, I'd seen them get re um, promoted and I'd been in and around the squad with your, you know, Mersons, Teddy Sheringhams, like your Kubus, like some good players at Portsmouth. And I wanted, I thought, I can play, I can play that level. I'm in training, I'm doing well in training when I'm a young kid, didn't get the opportunity, gone away, I've played 150, 160 games now, I can go here. Obviously went to Birmingham, we got up, we finished second in the end, but we got up um, and yeah, I just felt, I just felt ready and I felt like this is my time to really go to the next level. Um, unfortunately it wasn't because Steve Bruce wasn't the manager for me, even though I signed, I already had doubts. Like I'm quite methodical in my thinking and I'm quite, you know, I quite, I analyse it quite a lot and West Brom were, were in for me as well and Tony Mowbray was a manager and style of football suited me. Like I say, I'm a, I'm a link man. I'm more of a 10 as a striker. Um, it's hard to, 15 years ago, it was hard to be a 10 in England because there, there was no respect for people saying they want to play in between the lines. It's a lot easier now. Um, but I sort of wanted to go to West Brom, but they couldn't agree to fee. So Birmingham put the money down and it was one of those where, uh, I did think about it a lot. Everyone was like, you're crazy. You're like, you have to go. Luton are going to get relegated, like everything. And I was like, wait, if it needs to be right, if it's not right, then I don't really want to go. But in the end, I did, I went and we went up, but I sort of knew the differences between me and, and the manager as, as, as people. Uh, I knew the differences straight away. Um, and I knew that'd be hard for me because like I say, I've, I've encountered personality clashes before that and always known it's best to go your separate ways. So by that point, um, yeah, it was, it was never really going to work. And I was in the squad a couple of times. I was on the bench in the Prem. I remember a game against West Ham. I'm, I'm on the bench. We're one nil down at home. I'm thinking I'm deaf. I've got to come on. I'm a striker. And like the manager turned around. Knowing I've never played in the Prem. And he said, like, are you going on? And I thought he was talking to me put a left back on who was sat in front of me and the left back hadn't even been training or anything and he just, I just knew at that point, I was like, oh, I've got to leave here. But again, it's like the politics of football. He was wanting to get rid of me but didn't want to say it, you know what I mean? So I, in the end, I had to take it upon myself and I signed in January 07 and bought a house, moved in in June and by 
October, I was on loan at QPR. My family were living up there. And my, my missus had just had a baby. You know, it's all these things you go through and you think like, really, I want to, hey, I've just moved my family up here and we're in the Premier League, but I know my personality and I knew the manager's personality and I just thought, this, I've got to play football again. So couldn't wait to get out on loan really. And, I, and again, back to the championship and, and try to do my thing again. This is, this is where like, people talk about timing because I went on loan in October, October, November, December. My loan finished January the 2nd, but we drew Chelsea in the cup January the 6th. So our owner, uh, Flavio Briatore, the like, Italian billionaire, um, whatever, he, that's the perfect tie because obviously we're QPR, they're Chelsea, it's at Chelsea. And he wanted, obviously my last game, the crowd are singing, sign him up and all that kind of stuff. So I go back to Birmingham for a couple of days and then he's ringing me and he's like, there's a million pound they sign me for, but he's put, they're pushing a the boat out on the, on the contract to get me there because obviously I've got two years left in, in the Prem and the politics are that, you know, I haven't asked for a transfer, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And Birmingham, I think, were renowned at the time for, for not, paying people up, it was Karen Brady and David Gold, the guys that were at West Ham. So I was comfortable, so like I've played well. Like QPR want me, they've offered me this, this five year deal, like in principle. It's more money, it's a lot more money than what I'm on at, at Birmingham in the Prem. So I'll take it, but obviously I haven't asked for a transfer, of, you know, all this kind of stuff, but I, I would have just gone anyway. In the, I had a loyalty bonus coming, sort of, at, in about four or five days after the Chelsea game. So it was 150 grand. So I'm like, I only get it, it's a lawyer bonus. You only get it if you're there. So I was like, right, see how this goes. And then I get a phone call from Karen Brady. She just says to me, um, I know what you're doing, but if you stay for that 150 grand, then um, the transfer's off and you'll be training with the under 10s or whatever. And I said, I said, I'd never spoke to her before. That was the first time I spoke to her since I'd, I'd done the deal or whatever. And I was like, Okay, and then um, the chairman of QPR, another Italian guy, it's quite a passionate guy, he'd phoned her and told her the money they'd offered me. <laughs> so now she knows it's more. She's got the, she's got the, the, the aces. So at the end of the conversation, she's like, oh, by the way, I know exactly what they've offered you at QPR. So if you turn that down, good luck. And I was like, how does she know? So then the chairman obviously told me, he told her, so I, at that point, I had to make a decision. So I walked away from anything at Q uh, Birmingham, but said to QPR, like, I need this. And I ended up getting a massive signing on fee at QPR over the, over the five years. Um, it was like 170 grand a year for five years on top of my wages and stuff, which was, was good wages, um, especially for the championship at the time. And it was a no brainer financially. And it was, obviously it turned out being my last deal, really, um, in England, it was my last deal, but it was my biggest deal. And, you know, like, that was sort of financially really good for me. Plus it was giving me the platform to go back to QPR and be part of a, a project that they were trying to get to the Premier League and everything. And it was, it was exciting when I signed and it, was, it, it felt right. And it was the first time I'd been completely happy with a move because when I went to Luton, I was injured and I still had some, I'd been at, QP, I'd been at Portsmouth sorry, for 11 years, basically. So it was quite a pull to go. Um, the Birmingham one, it was sort of like, didn't really, didn't really rate the manager as soon as I spoke to him. But this one, it felt, it felt right. Good location, contract, you know, everything. So started off really well, two, three months. Um, got to April, end of the season, we're like, we're nowhere in the league. We're like mid table, but we've come from the bottom up. So now we're saying next year, we're going to go for it. And uh, first week of April, we were just doing a training session. It was an open day. So there was like fans were there, like little kids, you know, like a, just a family day really, doing a match at the end of training. And uh, the keeper was having a bad day, like American keeper, he was having a bad day. And I'm like, 
I'm a bit on him with the banter and everything, like a few people are, and I'm all, I'll always, always get on people in training, you know, like always have the banter and everything, and uh, I must have been on him a little bit, or not too bad, I don't know what it was, but um, I went through 1v1 and, and I shot, but I hit him in the face with the ball, but I was trying to score, but I'd probably hit it, it was quite close and I hit it hard rather than go for like a slot or something, and it must have hit him in the face, I don't know if he thought I meant it or whatever, I don't know what it was. I like, you know, I'm, I'm not a religious person or anything like that, but I'm, I believe in like fate or spiritual stuff. And um, two minutes later, the ball's gone straight through again. But this time, it's a bit more of a 50-50, and I think I'm just going to dink him. So I plant him my left foot, and I dink him with my right, and, and I look up, and I just bam, just he's a, you see him flying. He just flew into my left leg, just about, just below the knee. But with his knees, it was like two-footed but with his knees sort of thing, it was a bad, like, you just have the split second and I heard a snap and I'm just laying on the floor, he like flipped me, I'm laying on the floor and I'm like, oh God. and he just stood over me like, like saying stuff to me like, the like I remember like Roy Keane done it to Haaland and was on him like, he was doing that like, you just, and I'm like, you broke my leg and I knew instantly I'd broke my leg. Um, and then I looked down and was, yeah, my leg was a mess. It was like, it was like moving around and as I'm looking at it, but I can't feel, I can just feel this bursting pain in, 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 in my back, like a real stinging pain in my leg. And I'm looking at it like, I'm in trouble here. Um, it took a while because I weren't screaming off and they carried on playing. And then it took a while and then once they realized it was, it was mad, yeah. It was a bit, it was a bit crazy because um, obviously I went straight to hospital, went straight to private hospital in London and, ha and was going to have the, the operation. I, I broke my leg in three places. Um, and yeah, I had, had the operation done a couple of days and then I saw it on Sky Sports, just said like, a, like Rowan Vine breaks his leg in freak training ground accident. And it's the first thing I saw when it said accident, I was like, <sighs> so I'm, you know, I was speaking to my mum, speaking to like my, my girlfriend at the time and stuff, and thinking like, this ain't right, it's, it weren't an accident. Like, this is part of my makeup as a person, part of my upbringing. I believe in, I believe in like a fair deal. I believe in the truth. Um, and so the, the chairman come to see me, the captain and stuff, and then they were like, I said, look, I, this weren't an accident, why? And they said, oh, we'll look after you, like just, don't say anything, and you know, we'll, you know, you're one of our star players. We'll look after you. We we'll do whatever it takes, and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and they're saying, oh, the, the keeper wants to come and see you and apologise. I just said, I don't want him to come and see me. I know he, tr he, I don't think he tried to break my leg. Like in the past, people have think that I've accused him of trying to break. I don't know how you try and break someone's leg, but he he tried to hit me with force because he didn't want me. To, obviously taking the, taking the mickey or whatever. I don't know what he was thinking. That's, that's for him to answer. But, you know, that's what happened. And he meant to hurt me. So that's, if you're out of control, that's what can happen. And I didn't need to see him. Um, but he, anyway, he came after a couple of days when I'm in hospital and he was upset, crying and stuff. And I just said, look, as long as you can admit to me and you'll always say that, um, that, that it wasn't an accident and that, you know, it wasn't one of these coming together. It was like, you know, I mean, I'll have a little crumb of respect for you. And he just said, yeah, he said, um, the red mist come down. I don't know what I was thinking, but yeah, that, that happened. And, I'm, I've, uh, you know, I've got to live with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry and stuff. So that was the best scenario for me because I didn't want to go on telling everyone saying it's an accident and him pretending that he didn't mean to, you know, that he didn't do it on purpose and stuff. So um, that, was, that, that wasn't that was too bad. The, the problems I started getting was, like I say, I'm, I'd had three months out with a bad back, um, but I knew what the scenario was. Once the, once the medicine started working, I was fine. This was completely different. This was a, this was a bad, badly broken leg and, the circumstances is what affected me more because I was like, that's never happened to anyone before. Why, why has it happened to me? And 
am I, am I that much of a piss taker or like like is it <laughs> why was it why was it me sort of thing and I just threw myself into the rehab the only way I know how which is to do three sessions a day me and the physios were working around the clock to try and get back as quick as possible um, but as soon as I wasn't physically doing sessions I would be at home and my mind would be racing and you know even in the first rehab I started getting some physical signs of um, that were uncomfortable like I was getting a tight chest uh, sweaty palms um, just getting like a whirring in my mind like fast-paced like thoughts and then you know used to like run like not like, like do things too quickly, like run to the toilet and then run back and then drive too quickly when you've got loads of time. Just like, so I decided just to see the club GP and um, spoke to him and he just said, look, you're um, this like, there's sort of mild panic attacks, anxiety, and, and it's, it's all part of like sort of depression. He said, we're gonna, we're gonna treat you for, for depression alongside you trying to get your rehab. He said, but uh, if you try and make sense of things. He said the biggest thing in your life, football's been taken away and not in a, you know, not in, 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 a, in a sort of, in a bad way. So that's gonna play on your mind. So I've, in my head, I just thought, oh, that's, that sort of settles that. He gave me some, gave me some antidepressants, some mild antidepressants and said, see how you get on with them and as you're doing the rehab. I took the tablets for a few weeks, but it weren't really helping. I was sort of a, I was a little bit less physical symptoms, but I still, you know, I just, everything pinned on me getting back playing football. It just re it really did. And in, in, in my mind, that's what all I was thinking. Um, I played a game against Fulham reserve game after about four months, but I could feel my leg. I could feel it. And people say to me, no, you couldn't. I could feel it was broken. And um, I just said the next day in training, the ball hit me on the toe and where I broke my shin was like real high up. And when the ball hit my toe, I could, f I could feel it physically, something opening in, and I ended up going back to the specialist and he done a CT scan, which goes inside your bone, like takes like sections of your bone bit by bit. When he got to the fracture site, he said there was no bone there. It was what's known as a ghost bone. So it sort of closes up and there's, there's a little bit missing, but inside is hollow. So obviously that's what I could feel, the weakening of the, of the bone. And he just said, uh, you've got two options. You can let it heal naturally. I had a pin in there already, a titanium pin. And he said, you can let it try and heal around that naturally. Or the other option is we take it back out and we put a bigger, wider one in. So effectively cut my, knee open again and just re-break my leg so I had that done that was after five months after breaking it the first time I had it re-broken in surgery had a, another pin put back in and then we had to take loads of time because obviously the first rehab you're you're at it and you're going for it second one you're like oh, take it easy make sure it's you know, it was just science. It wasn't anything to do with the operation. It wasn't anything to do with anything. It was just, it just didn't work. And I had to have it redone. So obviously now I'm, I take another step back psychologically and a massive step back physically. I ended up coming back after 13 months, but that was the end of the season. So I, made, I played one game in May. Then it's pre-season, then you're coming back for the next season. So it ends up being sort of 16, 17 months. In that time, the owner of the club, who was a bit of a dictator, Italian guy, Flavio Briatore, and he, he wasn't, I didn't get on with him, he wasn't a nice person. He was, he was you know, I think one of his lines was, I'm so rich, I don't have to listen to anyone's opinion. And like when you've got someone like that in a football club, it's not going to work because there's plenty of people that need to have a say and plenty of people you have to work with. And, he basically tried to force me to go to Paris to have the second operation because the doctor that had done heart surgery for him, he wanted him to do the operation because he blamed the surgeon with, with literally no evidence because the surgeon's one of the best in London. Um, 
he forced me to go to Paris. I went to Paris and met the guy. The guy was about 90 and wasn't even allowed to do operations anymore because he's too old. So it was one of those. So I sort of disagreed with him, which wasn't, which wasn't a good thing. And we had, a, from then, I had three and a half years left on my deal and no real relationship with the owner. And then he sacking managers left, right and centre. Um, so when I came back from injury, all I want to do is play football and get back playing. Now I've got this other cloud over my head because he doesn't want me to play in the team. And he's telling managers not, they're not allowed to pick me. Like three managers have since have said to me that, yeah, he told them he's not allowed to, to play me. He sacked the manager, Paolo Sosa, who was probably my favourite manager at, at QPR. He wasn't there long, but unbelievable guy and like class, like person and a football man, you know, like unbelievable player for Portugal and, you know, like I just thought he was a really, really good guy and he sacked him in some weird circumstances and then he, he sort of summoned eight players to his office in, in Knightsbridge for a meeting and I didn't really want to go anyway and he asked me my opinion of the manager and I just said, you sacked him, so it doesn't matter. He's like, I want to know your opinion, so I gave him my opinion started shouting at me saying, that's wrong, he's, he's this, he's that. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's my opinion. And then I'd made a statement in the press about a player leaving, Dexter Blackstock. He'd been sent on loan to Nottingham Forest and he was our only fit centre forward. And I made, I made some comments, I just said, it's, it's a strange one, your top goal scorer leaving when you've got no fit centre forwards. I was the only, I was just coming back. So he demanded an apology in front of all these people in, in the office and I wouldn't, I wouldn't apologise because I said what, what everyone else was thinking and what everyone had said anyway, why is your top goal scorer leaving when you're six points outside the playoffs? But there was another reason why Dexter had left the football club. So he, he tried to like, demand an apology then belittle me in front of my teammates. So I stood up for myself like I always do and he told me you're never going to play for this club again, I'll give you... 500,000 tomorrow, get out of the club. And I was like, I've got, I've got three years left. Like, that's not the way it works. This is a guy that, this is a guy that made a Formula One driver crash into a wall. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and then tried to sack him. So his, his morals and principles were all over, all over the place anyway. So yeah, I stood up for myself and I knew the position I was in and I knew what contract I had. Um, so yeah, I just tried to let it blow over and, um, and I just thought it would get better. Uh, ultimately, it got worse, a lot worse. Yeah, so for like probably a year, I was a bit of a, an outcast under that regime because the, the owner was calling the shots. By about March 2010, I think it was, when Neil Warnock got a job, all the supporters were demonstrating against the owner, like, get out of our club, we want our club back. So the owner, I think they sold some shares, and he, or he, he took a step back anyway, because he knew that the crowd, the crowd and everyone didn't like him, and he was, his way of doing it wasn't working. So Neil Warnock came in, and was basically given license to do anything to run the club. I didn't know if that meant anything to me. I was supposed to play a reserve game that day. And Neil Warnock phoned me and just said, look, you're not playing the reserves. I've tried to sign you three times this season. QPR wouldn't let you go like on to Palace on loan. He said, but the owner, I know the problems you've had with the owner. He hasn't got a say, like, he won't tell me who to pick. Like, you're back in. And I come off the phone and I was thinking, oh, wow. Like, this, I'm, I'm back, I could be back here. Didn't think it would be Neil Warnock, the man that like, brings me back, but I'll take this. Um, started training with the first team again, was involved, was on the bench. Um, and then he, he started putting a, a young kid on in front of me, like a young striker. So I'm thinking that's a bit strange. Like he's come, he said to me, I'm going to be playing. Like he likes me as a player. Tried to sign me six times. All the all the good stuff you want to hear. Um, and didn't, didn't probably three or four weeks hadn't played. And then I'm in the gym, and he's in the gym, and he said, I need to speak to you. Um, 
And I said, okay, yeah, come, come to the office, whatever. I went to the office, um, and he's like, I'll take a seat. Felt, I felt awkward already, and he got a bit of paper, and he's like, oh, like, I know I, I, know I said you'd be playing, you'd be involved in that, you must, you know, it's a bit, you must think it's a bit funny. I said, oh, no, I don't know, I'm just, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I'm training hard, I wanna play, like you said. And he was like, oh, thing is, you, like, your money's a problem. And I sort of said like, oh, how's my, like, my money's a problem, what do, you, what do you mean? And he's got a bit of paper and he's like, oh, well, next year, next season, if you start and you score, you're earning like 24 grand a week. And I was like, yeah, I know. He's like, flipping out, like, you know, like, that's a problem for the, for the club. And I said, well, uh, how's it a problem? Like, it's, it's, that's my contract, I signed it two years ago, I was like, it's not a problem for me. And he was like, then the conversation sort of changed. I'm sort of thinking, where are we going with this? And he said, look, you know, I'm in control of the team and I'm the one who's picking the team. And he said, like, the only way, you sh the only way you're gonna play in the team is if we come to some sort of agreement. And I just said, look, I've had the worst couple years here I said, what you said to me about playing and you've like, like I want to play, but I don't, you know, I mean, this, this, ain't, this is not something I'm, I'm, I mean, I can do. And he was like, he said, look, your appearance money is five grand in appearance. If you start a game, like, or if you come on sub, I'm in control of that. So if we come to an agreement, a deal, then you'll be back in. And I said, look, no, it doesn't, it's not something I'm going to do. Um, and like, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that he was giving me the chance to play, but he was taking away some of my money. And he was talking of like, he wanted like six grand cash a month or something like that. And he started talking numbers. I was like, why are you talking numbers? I said, it's not happening. And he said, what, what do you mean? I said, look, just let me leave the office. I said, like, it's not happening. <laughs> I'd heard rumors that he'd done stuff like that or said, you know, that some people have, have met, had rumours, you know, you hear things, but I didn't think he would just come to me and and put it on me like that. And I was a bit shocked. And then I was just like, well, what, what happens from here? He was really shocked because he couldn't see the bad side of the deal. And for me, I would have been earning more money and playing football if I'd have took the deal. But it's not a deal that I can take as a, ma as a man. Like, I've got morals and principles. I've got two sons. That, that want to play football. And they're, at the time, they're probably six and three. And I'm thinking, and I'm a good enough player to play in his team. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I've been through all this stuff where psychologically, physically, I've been on the deck already. And then I come and he's offering me this olive branch, but it comes at a cost. And I'm like, I said, listen, this is how, I said, if you want me to play for your team, just ask me. Other than that, we, we never need to speak again. Um, and I don't know if he thought that was genuine or I didn't know how long it was going to go on for. But, yeah, that, that, that happened sort of in, in sort of just at the end of what, towards the end of that season. I actually played. I actually played two games. We drew and we won one at home. And I, I had to come off because I felt something right at the bottom of my left leg, the leg that I broke. I felt a pain. So I had this on the back of me, him saying this, and then, then this injury come about at the end of the season. Um, I went to see the specialist and I had a stress fracture. Uh, and he said, you need, you need like 12 weeks rest, just complete rest, there's no operation, complete rest. So I'd already struggled, I hadn't been back long, I hadn't been playing much. Um, then I go through this kind of scenario and then I'm back injured again. So behind the scenes, I think the club decided they were going to offer me a pay up and I was injured. So even at that point, I'm like, I don't even really want the pay up because I'm 12 weeks rest. Like, and this, I went on holiday and the surgeon was like, stay on a, stay on a like, sunbed, get people to bring you. Well, I can't, you know, I come back July. I got the, I got the all clear, the stress fracture had gone. 
I come back July, I'm like seven kilos overweight because I've been doing nothing, literally nothing, because they told me to, and that's what he said. But then you come back and you're out of favour, the manager doesn't care. He, doesn't, he sat me down the first day and said, you're never going to play for this club, you're never going to play for me, um, unless you take the deal that I've offered you. He said, right, you're, we've took your squad number off you, I heard the club are paying you up, like, that's it. Um, the club, the chairman offered me, uh, the pay-up he offered me in, in principle, he'd offered me all of my money. I had two years left, they offered me all of my money, but they wanted to pay me over three years. And I said, okay, that's, put that in writing and I'll take that. So I come back in the July, I need treatment, I've just been given the all clear. They've got a new physio that the manager had bought from Crystal Palace. He didn't even say hello to me, and I thought that's strange. And then wasn't wasn't allowed to be treated. I was like at the back of the line, like kids in front of me, and then they yeah, wouldn't treat me. I said like, I've been given the all clear from a stress fracture. Have I got a training program? He said no, no. You just just, just start pre-season. So I tr started trying pre-season, trying to run and that, but I needed. Then I got sent with a youth team, youth team physio. Um, and I had to try and train with the youth team uh, while they were sorting this pay up out through August. I had it in principle, had it in like principle that that, um, that they were going what the deal they were going to give me. So I was speaking to other clubs. I spoke to um, I spoke to Blackpool and they'd been promoted to the Prem. And Ian Holloway was like, "If you pass a medical, we'll take you, no problem. But we'll pay you like two grand a week." I was like, "It's, it's not a problem. I've got this." this pay up sorted, like this, that's, that's brilliant, like I need, this is what I need. Um, so the last day of the window, I needed to be paid up to sign for Blackpool. They'd heard that I was signing for Blackpool, so then they, they made an offer of like 50% of my money, but wanted to pay over three years. And I just said, if you give me 50% up front, I'll go today. Then they said, we're not offering you that and took the offer away. That was it, um, didn't, and that was it done, so I couldn't leave, so I was now there. And then, yeah, I think from that point is when it got really bad, like in terms of the treatment of me, they were trying to antagonise me a lot of the time. Um, I had to train with a youth team, I got, obviously my, my squad number got took off me, then I got kicked out of the changing room, I had to go into the youth team changing room, like no locker. Then I'm training with the youth team every day. And then some days I'm, I have to train on my own because the youth team, I can't train with the youth team. Um, I, I had to speak to the PFA. I spoke to my agent and he was just like, look, it's a tough position because you're not fit. You're not ready to go out on loan or anything, but they've, they're paying you your contracts there. You have to honor your contract and you have to, you have to do what you're, you know, this is the best option to stay there at the moment because they've, they've killed your move to Blackpool and that was, he come to me another three or four times offering me deals. Like, <laughs> I said, look, I this was a one conversation we had and I said, don't speak to me about money ever again. Like, but like, what do they say? Greed is the only snake that can't be charmed. Like he thought if he treated me worse, I'm more inclined to take in the deal. But my nature is no, like I'm less inclined to do the deal. I don't care about, this isn't about football. You've made it purely about greed and about money. And now you're trying to affect my career and my life. No, well, I, I tried to speak to the PFA because they were holding back my signing on fees. Um, and the PFA ended up getting me my money, but that's all they could really do for me because they said, as long as there's five or six people training, it's not illegal. And I was banned from reserve games. So I'm trying to get myself fit and get out on loan, but I'm not allowed to play reserve games. I think one day on my birthday, I'm supposed to be playing and Charlton are coming and watch me play and I'm sub for the reserves. So I refuse, I, 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 I'm going to go home because they've killed me. Um, and then, then one of the players comes in and says, look, if you go, he's going to find you two weeks wages for refusing to play. But I was, I was on the bench and I'm supposed to be playing to get out. So the, what they were doing was giving me no chance to get back fit 
but then blaming everything on me not getting fit. So I, I couldn't do anything. Ended up claiming compensation for my broken leg for loss of earnings. But I went to press and said that I sued the club. I didn't sue the club, I claimed compensation. They settled out of court. It was for negligence because it was a, it, it was negligent to tackle. So I, they settled out of court, but they refused to admit that they were in the wrong. So they could say I was suing the club. So when that happened, I went to a game with my son, he was six years old, and I'm walking, I had to leave early because these stories are in the press. So I'm getting some flack off the fans. So I'm walking to back to my car and past the pub and I hear like, ah, oh, you greedy fat prick and all this stuff, fine. And I look round and I've got my son with me and someone's just thrown a pint glass and it's smashed like next to my head. So my son's grabbed my hand, he's shaking. And I'm like, my first thing is like, who's thrown, who's thrown that like, who's done that? Come. <laughs> then I realise my son and then, and it's just like the narrative being pushed from a football club against one of its employees is like, that's what they banned me from speaking to the press because they said they'd find me if I said anything negative in the press. So all these things were happening. I couldn't really have a voice at the time and struggled for years and years after to have a voice. And it's only really, I don't want to be 60 years old still telling this story. So I've decided to put my part of it, point of it across now and people are going to say whatever they want, you know what I mean? But these things happened and, you know, I didn't need to go through to the extent of what happened and there's a, there's a way to, to go about things, I think, and, and they didn't do it properly. John Gorman, the assistant manager, who was Glenn Eddles' assistant manager for England, he was my assistant manager at QPR with uh, Jim Jilton. He was now at MK Dons. I've come in and there's a game against MK Dons, but I'm not even in the squad, the reserve squad. So I see John and he's fuming because he's a proper football guy. He's like, what are they doing? And I said, look, I'm just not allowed to play. I just have to train every day on the bike or whatever. He said, you play for us then? And I said, what? And he said, yeah, you play for us. So I end up going into the MK Dons changing room, like, and just playing for MK Dons against QPR, like in a, in a reserve game. And it was, it was good for me because two months later they took me on loan. But it was just like, it was crazy. I, yeah, I had to get a letter of permission from the FA to train with Portsmouth to try and stay fit because um, they wouldn't let me train. He, he come up to me at one point, um, Neil Warnock, and was like, I've got a letter from the club saying you can just stay at home for the rest of your contract. I said, I'm 27 years old. I've got two years left, 19 months left at that point. He said, yeah stay at home, I don't want to see you. And I'm like, that ain't good enough. I need to play, I need to get fit, I need to play. I'm like, this is my job, this is, this is my career, this is my life. Um, and it just, you know, I didn't get the help. Basically, the PFA got me my money, like I say, and, and you know, like after I had some other problems when I was in Scotland, like, um, I started drinking really heavily, probably, the last year and a half of my QPR contract. Um, I wasn't training and playing. And I'd been on a couple of loans that weren't very successful because every time I went on loan, it was for a month and I was trying to get fit. Um, and it's just the situations were, were tough. Um, so I'd be back at QPR, not training, training on my own. And I broke up with my missus like a lot, of, a lot of stuff went on off the pitch, which was a direct consequence of the position I was in. So I started just drinking a lot, um, going out, I was going out a lot. Um, not a drinker in the pub or a bottle of whiskey, I'm just going out, I'm just in, enjoying, like I'm, I'm getting paid well, I'm, I'm a QPR, I'm never gonna say, you know, like it was all this and that. I, I played my part at, at certain times, I've made bad decisions, but a lot of these decisions are influenced by the position I'm in. And like I said, I've got an agent, but I don't have a dad to go to. I don't have any father figures to go to. I don't have any people that have been in my position that are gonna give me guidance or advice. Um, now, stupidly, I, in 2011, I went to the manager and I said to him, listen, this, is, this has got to stop. I'm in a bad place. I'm drinking a lot, I need, I need help. And he just said to me, look, you've got the PFA's number, don't, don't bother me. Um, so, yeah, that was it. The PFA 
tried to help. I think one point at QPR, the, the guy from Sporting Chance, Peter Kay, I think he came in because he was friends with Joey Barton. I don't know if Joey had been there or something. And it, I thought, I thought it, it felt organic on a day because I was just watching training from the canteen. And he came over and started speaking to me. Um, and he was like, oh, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. And he was just like, oh, you're not. You don't, I can see something in your eyes. And I was just like, all right, mate, whatever. And I just left because I didn't know whether that had been set up. I didn't know whether someone was trying to trap me. These, a lot of these times, I'm, I'm paranoid. I'm thinking about wearing a wiretap and stuff, about getting, because I know this stuff's illegal, what he's, what he's asking me to do. Do you know what I mean? Like, these, these thoughts have gone through my head. Don't, you know what I mean? I've gone through every single, like, thing in my mind that can, every, every single, like, outcome or what I can do to sort of get out of this position. And I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't until a couple of years later in, um, in Scotland, where I was living on my own, wasn't drinking, I was playing again, wasn't drinking, but, I still had a lot of this stuff weighing me down. I started gambling heavy, like high stakes gambling, and this was taking up a lot of my days just to take me out of the place where I was in my mind, thinking about all, all the stuff I'd gone before. These, I've lost my, well, I've lost my career, I've lost my family, I've lost everything at that point. All I had was money, that's all I had. I had, a, <laughs> I had quite a lot, so I was like, I wanted to play football. I left, I went to St. Johnston, I played 40 games finished third in the league, scored like 10 goals. I, I felt like I was back. The manager, Steve Lomas, said he was going to take me to Millwall. He got the Millwall job and then he didn't take me to Millwall. And something like that shouldn't crush me, but it crushed me. Like, I thought, I'm going back to London. Perfect scenario. I can relaunch my career in the championship where I belong. But he, t he decided to sign someone else. I saw him a few years later and even he got upset and he apologised. Well, my reputation had been dirtied by my time at QPR because I didn't play for three years and I'm out in the nightclubs and I'm out here and the fans and I'm out there and, and people know me and people see that I'm not playing but they see I'm, I'm, doing, you know, I'm enjoying my life, they think I'm enjoying my life and all this and then I got just got, obviously you go to your manager who's not backing you and you're a complete outcast and you tell him you're struggling with alcohol well, within three weeks, I got players laughing at me, calling me an alcoholic, thinking it's funny. In, 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 like my own teammates at QPR, they're like, um, so then I, I signed for Gillingham in 2012, just for a few games at the end of the season. They didn't pay me any money. I was paying my own hotels, paying my own travel. They weren't paying any of my wages. It was just for me to go and get games. People have accused me of not wanting to play football. I've played for free. I've played for free in three of my loans. I played for free, but anyway, he said to me, Andy Hessenthaler, he said, look, no one has gave you a good re um, reference. No one. He said, like, I can't believe it. He said, because you've been a joy to work with. And I was like, look, it takes one or two people to kill your reputation. When I was, the last two years at QPR, when it was sort of probably the last year and a half, when they were top of the league um, and looking like they were going to get promoted, I was just... I wasn't, there was no group to train with, so I was, I was, I was just travelling to training and going on an exercise bike, going in the gym, having lunch and going home. Um, and like I say, I'd been to the club and asked them for help, nothing. I didn't really have any other options to get help, so I was just driving in and just used to like, probably seven, eight months every day would be in tears on the way to training because I didn't, I didn't believe that's where my life was. I had two... I had two sons and they love football and one day I remember my, my oldest son come into the room I'm watching TV and sat on the sofa and he's like, Dad, come and play football. And I was just like, oh, no, I'm tired. And he went out the room and <laughs> my other son was only three but he's in the, in the hallway and he must have said, oh no, Dad's tired, don't, don't go in there. And my, little, my younger son was like, oh yeah, but we need Dad, like, we need Dad to play for the game. And my oldest son was like, no, no, leave him, he's tired. And he went out, they went playing football, whatever, and I was just sat on the sofa thinking, I can't even get off the sofa to play football with my kids. Like, that's where I'm at. Um, couldn't really see a way out. Everything I tried wasn't really working. Every option I tried um, 
to get help. Like it, it, it was just a non-starter, really. I mean, I could have. There's things I would do now. I'd be vocal. I'd tell people. But I remember Stan Collymore in like '99 said he had depression and he got absolutely vilified for it. You know, what I mean, that's 20 years ago. Like this, I'm going through this probably 10, 11 years ago. And I didn't think I could speak to people and say what was really going on, and, and, and I wasn't really allowed to at the time. I just, I left on the last day of my contract, you know, like I ran down the contract because they got promoted and in the last year, Mark Hughes, he got given a bit of paper with everyone's names on, and the first three or four days, he didn't even acknowledge me. And I said hello to him in the corridor and that, and I'm thinking, he doesn't even know who I am. Like, he, like, legit doesn't know who I am and he wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily need to, he'd been a Premier League manager and then he pulled me and he was like, Viney, I'm really sorry, like, I didn't, I didn't even have your name written on a bit of paper, like, I didn't even know, he said, I've got 30 names here and your name weren't even written on them and I was like, <laughs> do you know what I mean, so I trained once, in, I trained once with the first team squad in over two years at QPR and people want to point the finger just solely at me. I'm not pointing the finger just solely at any manager or a QPR, but how you're ever going to get a level of fitness or professionalism back if you can't train with your, your teammates, they'll have to answer that or someone will. But um, yeah, I stayed till the last day of my contract and ended up leaving And in 2012 when they, they got relegated from the Premier League um, and I left. Uh, yeah, I left at the end of my contract and went and signed for St Johnston to try and relaunch my career, so... Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I've, I've wrestled with this a, a, a lot, you know, I've, um, I've been through, I've had four years of therapy, um, just completed that at the end of last year and that took me full circle, back through childhood, back through everything, and then, then realising who I am as a person and, and where I want to get to and how I can help people in certain situations. But looking back at the time, I didn't have the ability to, to change anything else. My only, at 28, when I left QPR, I had a conversation with my mum about retiring, and she said, just do what makes you happy, but don't have any regrets. Now, I'd not played football for three years in my prime, but I wanted to prove people that I could still play football. That is the overriding factor. But at 28, maybe I should have walked away um, and had a break. Like I'm a massive advocate of having a break from football. I stopped playing at 31. That's too early. I made my debut at 18, that's 13 years. I should still be playing. I've only just stopped playing now semi-pro the last two weeks because I'm a footballer. I've dedicated my whole life to it. But at 31, I couldn't even look at a football pitch. And that's got to change, not just my story. It's a bit different to other people's, but it has to change. People can't be going into an industry full of hope and, and dreams and coming out of it broken. Uh, I, I was broken. The, the financial side of it, probably with two years left at QPR, the best thing for my emotional state would have been to walk away with nothing. But these times I've got three, four houses, two young children, supporting a family, like everyone around me, my financial advisor, my agent, everyone is like, no, 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 don't be silly. You can't walk away from this, you're injured. You can't walk away from this f for no deal. How are you gonna support people? Like the lifestyle, whatever it is. Like, I'm a simple person, I don't need a lot of stuff, but when you set yourself up in a certain place, I'm 27, 28, I think I've got at least another six, seven years of, of, of this. Um, I earned that contract, I earned that contract. And so now my option was to pay a manager who I don't even rate. What, I'm, I'm a Sunday league player? No, it's not going to happen. And I'm, I can't look my sons in the eyes. If, if, if I played 100, 100 Premier League games, but I had to pay my manager to, they won't take me seriously. So I, I don't think I could have done nothing differently. Obviously, getting the help or the help being there, the right help being there. Because like I say, I've been to rehab, Sporting Chance, that was, that was an experience. It wasn't what saved me, you know, like therapy, one-to-one -one counseling is what's made me deal with all the things I've been through, definitely.